Welcome and good evening. I'm Mary Bilo. I'm one of the librarians here at the Hedberg Public Library. And I want to thank you all for coming tonight to our program, Wisconsin's Native Peoples. Um, indigenous populations experience profound cultural changes in the times leading up to and after contact with Europeans. Our speaker tonight, Professor Emeritus uh, Roland Rodell, <laughs> yes, very, very fancy title, um, will discuss pre-European history gleaned from archaeological documentation of mounds and material remains. Professor Rodell earned his PhD in anthropology at the University of Milwaukee and taught at UROC for 18 years before he officially retired in 2020. And he has conducted archaeological research in the upper Mississippi Valley, including Wisconsin, for many years. Now over to Professor Rodell. Does this work? <laughs> Good, thank you. I bring this up just very briefly. Uh, I have my interest in archaeology and Native Americans came when I was an undergraduate going for a degree in geography so I could be a city planner. <laughs> and if any of you are taking the interstate through La Crosse going to the, to the Mississippi Valley in Minnesota, you'll come into the valley and you see all this mall sprawl. That wasn't there in the 70s. It was still farms and Highway 16. <clears throat> and I was taking a class from this professor, and he uh, said, uh, hey, they're starting to clear the ground out there on Highway 16. Let's go out there and take a look. Uh, and he taught anthropology. Yeah, he was an archaeologist. And so I got in the back of his motorcycle, and we zoomed out there. And they'd taken the topsoil off for most of it. And we took about 10 steps on this dirt. And Jim Gallagher's the guy named, he, bend, he picked over and picked up a big chunk of pottery. To make a long story short, it turned out it was a fortified village that was dated to roughly about maybe 100 years before Europeans arrived in the valley. I grew up about two and a half miles from this place. And I had no idea. Uh, I used to think as a kid that the only thing Native Americans did was chase wagon trains for a living <laughs> or put up posters of John Wayne and shoot arrows at it or something like that, you know. Uh, I just got intrigued. And uh, so basically the rest is history. <clears throat> it's been a very informative profession. Uh, <clears throat> and it's had its challenges in many ways as well yeah? because we're dealing with the descendants, if not the people themselves, the remains of artifacts and that of peoples that are still living today. You know, so it's been quite interesting. And I think, I'm just going to go back. I think this is a Seth Eastman uh, drawing from the late 19th century of women, of course, harvesting uh, rice, wild rice. And wild rice used to be very prevalent in the Mississippi Valley before the lock and dam system came in, uh, you could find it. And we know it was being harvested by uh, the first peoples that lived here uh, when they began notably farming in the upper Mississippi Valley. So uh, what I want to uh, give you, start with, uh, we have, and I think I got this right, and I think there's an expert here who could uh, straighten me out if I don't have it quite right. <laughs> but uh, tribes and reservations, uh, tribal lands, and so forth. Uh, we have, and I put here, most of them are Algonquin-speaking peoples. Uh, there's also, in, in southeastern Canada, there was a group of Native Americans called the Al Algonquians, with K-I-N at the end. But the language is quite widespread and has various dialects, right? dialects <laughs> et cetera. Uh, and the same thing with the Siouan language as well. Um, I think it was I can't, Edward Saper, who was a linguist in the first half of the 20th century, uh, came to the realization that although the Ho-Chunk are Siouan speakers and the Santee Sioux are uh, uh, Siouan speakers, that uh, the two could not really converse. And I, I liken the analogy to uh, English is a Germanic language, but if I'm around Germans, <laughs> Octa Lieber, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so uh, 
uh, either within these languages there are all these dialects as well. Yeah. So what I'm trying to get at is at least uh, in Native Americans in the United States, what is now the United States and Canada, but in the Northeast and the Mississippi Valley, which is my interest, huh, there are a lot of dialects, there are a lot of different languages, and it's not that they always got along together, but uh, there is a long history of success because we can see this in the results from what we find uh, either on the surface or uh, elsewhere uh, of Native Americans. <laughs> and they just have, they had their times and periods like we're going through times and periods, uh, ups and downs uh, and so forth. Now, with this, uh, these are the uh, tribes, uh, Wisconsin tribes and, and reservations. We have the Menominee, who seem to have been here, as far as anyone knows, a lot longer than any other of the Algonquin-speaking uh, groups. The whole chunk uh, have a long, long legacy here as well. Uh, <coughs> Red Cliff, uh, the Ojibwa or Chippewa, as they refer to, uh, they are from basically southern parts or the southeastern part of the broad geographic area of Canada. <clears throat> and they were beginning to, it appears, starting to move westward on a slow pace, uh, as in part being pressured by the Iroquois, notably. Uh, and then uh, Bad River, is that your? Yes. Uh, that's also uh, basically an Algonquin speaking uh, language. That you have, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, Willie. <laughs> okay, and uh, Bad River, uh, St. Croix, uh, the Chippewa, there are, there's a lot of Ojibwe or Chippewa peoples now in Wisconsin. Uh, St. Croix, Le Couture, uh as well, Lac du Flambeau, uh, and then the Potawatomi. Uh, the Potawatomi, at least we know early, his, very early historically, uh, we're residing in what's mostly Michigan now and a little bit into Canada, <coughs> but not by much. Uh, <coughs> let's see. And at Mole Lake, of course, the uh, Chippewa and the Oneida, <coughs> the Iroquois. <coughs> they were actually part of the five uh, tribes that loosely united uh, across upstate New York. <coughs> and they were spread out across upstate New York east to west or west to east. Uh, and they refer to this association as the Longhouse. And they built longhouses. And they lived in them. Uh, and so they saw this loose confederation. They referred to it collectively as the Longhouse going east and west. And then we have Brother Town, a mix of some northeast tribes. I think the population is about 4,000. A former colleague of mine, Renee Grailowitz, I don't know, I've probably never heard of her, but she belongs to Brother Town. And, and um, she has been working with others for years uh, to get federal recognition. Uh, and I haven't talked to her now for about three years, but the last time I did talk to her, she, she was saying basically, I think we're about this close. <laughs> but then it seems to get wider. <laughs> yeah, and it's unfortunate. And it really is in many ways. Oops, going the wrong way. So, one of the last major disturbances, in a sense, you could say before Anglo-Americans or Europeans really got steeped into it, were the Iroquois Wars. <clears throat> and uh, the wars were fought basically over, as I just simply list here, access to French trade, uh, access to trade routes as well, and access to beaver furs and the habitats of which beavers uh, existed in. <clears throat> the French were excluding the Iroquois uh, from this trade system. Oh, yeah, can you see that little red dot? Okay. Uh, of course, this is where the Iroquois League existed here in upstate New York. Yeah. And they had Iroquoian relatives that spoke the Iroquoian language. Uh, the Huron right here, and a number of smaller groups, the Putun uh, through here, and this is an interesting name, the, the neutral. And I'd, I'd read this before. I've, I've read quite a bit about this area, and I couldn't figure out who would name themselves the neutral. And just recently, in reading a, an article uh, about a person who studied the Iroquois a lot, pointed out that they're called the neutral because if anyone ever recorded their name, it got lost. <laughs> and so it was a big mystery for me to be solved. <laughs> 
nonetheless, we have these various Iroquoian groups and, of course, Algonquin speakers as well. So uh, in about 1640, uh, the Iroquois uh, began attacking the Huron, <laughs> notably because they were the major competitors with the Iroquois. So the Huron area, I can switch back and forth here too. Oops. Now I'm really going back, right? The Huron area was right through here, the, the heart of Huron land. And they controlled the trade routes. <laughs> Uh, they were the gatekeepers to the west, and uh, they excluded the Iroquois. <clears throat> so uh, what took place was basically the Iroquois said, we want access to trade. And they started this period of about 60 years of warfare. And they attacked other Iroquoian peoples, like the neutral, <laughs> and others, Algonquin peoples as well. Uh, and uh, Iro this map only goes up to the mid 1600s. But by 1680s uh, or 1690, whoop, darn it, I'm pressing the wrong thing here. There we go. Uh, by about 1680, 1690, there were uh, large Iroquois parties that were attacking the uh, Illinois Indians as well. <clears throat> so it went over several generations as it was taking place. And finally, the Iroquois succumbed in about seven, 1700. And uh, we're thinking of eventually aligning themselves, which I think they did. Now they aligned themselves with the, um, the French and the French and Indian War, <laughs> so forth. So uh, when I'm pointing this background out, it's, it, there's, it's a historic example. There's always been issues, problems, changes in territorial. Uh, also, ways of communicating as well. <laughs> Uh, back and forth between groups that spoke different languages, etc., and it had this period of ups and downs and so forth, politically, socially, uh, and so etc., etc., etc. So what I want to do is point out some things about Native Americans, <laughs> and that uh, Native Americans we may stereotype them quite a bit in a way, but they lived extremely diverse lives and had large areas that they occupied economically and possibly even politically as well. And part of that can be identified with what's left today, the mounds and the mound builders, et cetera. And as we know, Wisconsin has a unique set of mounds in our state. Yeah. So I'm gonna start with going back here uh, to about roughly 3,000 years ago, not quite. Uh, and there's a fabulous site in northeastern uh, Louisiana uh, that I got a chance to visit a number of years ago. Uh, and it's called Poverty Point. Now, what is interesting about Poverty Point, I'm going to press the wrong button here, I know, is that uh, this portion of the site, and it used to be thought that uh, this is a bayou, it's not the Mississippi. It's a number of miles from the Mississippi. It was thought that this is all eroded away. But further research, uh, especially looking at soil profiles down in the bank, this embankment here, indicates that it was basically like this when it was being built. The distance from here to here is a mile. So it's quite large. These ridges right here, they're only about a foot high maybe two feet at best, but given all the debris over the decades that build up in here, like broken pottery, uh, marine shell, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're estimating that these ridges were probably about eight to 10 feet in height. And what was on them were houses. And then there's a central plaza, as you can see right here, uh, and these walkways are open ways. And there's this large mound right here. Uh, a colleague of mine who's now retired, he thinks that, he hasn't really studied this, but his hypothesis is actually, this is re reflecting a huge bird. Its wings, its head, etc. And bird imagery is quite common amongst, especially we can see this in the past, but even today. So I bring up Poverty Point 
in part because it's a really neat place. But don't go in the summertime. It's really hot. <laughs> Nonetheless, and it wasn't that easy to find either. <laughs> but that's another story. At Poverty Point, all of these items see right here. You can see them over here as well. All those items have been found at the Poverty Point area. They were part of an elaborate trade network. <laughs> they got copper from the Great Lakes. And you can uh, have someone do the analysis of the copper, because uh, there are little signature traits, whether it says the Great Lakes or in the Appalachians or someplace like that fashion. Uh, what's simply listed is gray flint, uh, galena. Of course, we know about that. Other kinds of flints, chertz, uh, magnetite, quartz, uh, even gravels, etc. Uh, they were having trading for that. Sandstone, there isn't a lot of stone on the surface in Louisiana. <laughs> um, and other kinds of chertz, another type of stone, uh, and steatite as well. At least that are, those are the things that preserve, obviously. There had to be a lot of perishable items that were going into Poverty Point. Uh, some scholars think that it wasn't that heavily populated, that it may have been uh, uh, an annual area, a ceremonial area. Regardless of what your interpretation is, it's very large. Uh, and it's quite impressive as well. <clears throat> so uh, we're looking at a date that's going back roughly about 3,000 years ago. I'm going to move over here. I feel like I'm leaving you out. <laughs> One of the most fantastic, and I haven't had a chance to see them, but I've read quite a bit about them, are the earthquakes in southern Ohio. Uh, the name that's given to the natives that did this is Hopewell, because the first investigation, legitimate investigation, in the mid-19th century, about approximately, uh, <clears throat> was uh, by an avocational archaeologist uh, who documented a lot of these earthworks. Huge earth and mounds, yeah. uh, and earthwork forms. Yeah. And this is one of the, if you were to look at for Hopewell or Middle Woodland culture, uh, you would find probably this image right here. Yeah. It's a golf course now. But it's been pre the, the ridges have been preserved. So there's a large circular one here. And then an avenue is referred to. Uh, and then an octagonal shape, I believe it is, uh, walls or ridges. There have been some, there are others that are similar to this. This is the largest one and the best preserved. Uh, they've cross-sectioned it to see if there is actually posts that have been put in the ground. Yeah. And that you could find evidence that if the posts were there and they, the wood had rotted, you'd see the stains from But no, this is how they were laid out. Yeah. And it appears as though the thinking is, they were some sort of major ceremonial centers. Furthermore, there's been, it's faint, but it's been found evidence of roadways going between these and other ones. Now, there was no, the only form of transportation was walking or, you know, going by water. And so uh, the thinking is that uh, down in the southern part of Ohio, there's a lot of ritual activity taking place yeah, to ensure the cosmos most likely would stay intact, et cetera. <clears throat> and also places where people would come to visit from great distances. Now, in southern Ohio, again, trade was taking place. And there are remnants of what's called Hopewell in the Mississippi Valley. If you've ever been to Trempolo, Wisconsin, great state park. <laughs> uh, I, I miss it living here. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, there was uh, some large mounds uh, that had Hopewell material in them. Yeah. And one of them was excavated by the Milwaukee Park Museum in 1928, I believe it was. Uh, and it had river pearls in it. It had copper, um, trying to think what else, uh, which basically are referred to as exotic items, etc. cetera. Yeah. So this, clearly, the Hopewell peoples were part of a, a very large, extensive trade network. And here are some of the things listed right here. Uh, Knife River, Cal Sydney from North Dakota. Yeah. Uh, 
Obsidian from Wyoming, notably Yellowstone National Park, has been traced. Obsidian just is an obsidian. There are different chemical elements that you can identify the source, if you can find a source, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, grizzly bear teeth uh, from the Western Plains, lead, pearls, chert of kind of hornstone, uh, quartz, alligator teeth, shark's teeth have been found in uh, the early excavations of mounds. You know buried with these people. <clears throat> so it had to have been a very elaborate trade network uh, down the line. There was a thought that maybe someone, uh, this is like at the beginning of the 20th century, w went from Ohio and went all the way out to Yellowstone Park <laughs> to get uh, uh, obsidian. Uh, most people kind of said, and it doesn't seem logical, it's most likely down the line trading for other things and eventually going to the source of where you're getting it from or where it's supposed to end up as well. Okay. Uh, also things like conch shells, uh, et cetera. So the core of this was in the very southern part of Ohio, as shown on this map right here. Okay. So one of the most fascinating uh, structures uh, is the serpent mound from southern Ohio. This a small portion of it had been excavated going crosswise. But the person who did it thought this is something that has to be saved. Uh, and so he made an affiliate, he's from, his name is Frederick Putnam. He was from, he taught at Harvard, he didn't teach at Harvard, he ran the museum there. And he got this wealthy woman to fork out all this money to preserve this. This was the first mound of antiquity in the Americas to be preserved for the future. It's not quite clear who made it, besides saying Native Americans, and most likely who the Native Americans were living in southern Ohio at the time. But there hasn't been much other work that's been done on it. It's been preserved. And as I put down here, its length, well, I put it down twice to make emphasize it. <laughs> Uh, 1,348 feet. And I looked up, I thought, is this what it would be when it was stretched out? Uh, or is it following you know, the curvature? And I think it's following the curvature uh, of it. So it was quite impressive. <clears throat> uh, and its average height is about three feet. But it's been suggested that most likely, again, some erosion had taken place in weathering uh, had lowered it a little bit. But none of it was very obvious. <clears throat> And so uh, it's an effigy type of mound, but it's the only one that's been found in Ohio. There's also one in uh, Georgia, northern Georgia. Uh, and this is a photograph I took myself. I was at a conference in Atlanta, and three of us decided to rent a car and drive out a number of miles uh, through the nice countryside to visit it. It's a bird effigy. It's called Rock Hawk. It's estimated age. It's problematic, about 2,000 to 3,000 years. Uh, and I put down here the length uh, and the width uh, of it. And all it is is piled up stones. And when it was uh, decided to make a park, the stones, some of them are scattered and so forth. Um, so the people who reconstructed it had, came with the assumption that it would be in cross-section basically like this uh, and so forth. So uh, it's one of the rare uh, types of effigy mounds of any kind that's been preserved in the southeastern part of the United States. But then we get to, yeah, well, it, it's very southern, kind of uh, central southwest, and I think it's maybe about 20 miles from the Ohio River, yeah, north there. Yeah. And you could, you know, if, you, if you're planning to go look at it, you can go to the tourist industry, I'm sure, and they can tell you where it is, yes. Uh, but I'd like, I have not seen it uh, myself. I have not visited or taken the opportunity to do this. But then we get to one of the most interesting areas in North America. And this is the effigy mound tradition, and that's what it's referred to. <laughs> Why uh, all these mounds were built in Wisconsin and very few in northeastern Iowa, um, there is some mounds. 
<coughs> their effigy mounds, I should say, and a little bit into Illinois as well. <coughs> and this is the type of pottery, for the most part, that's associated with it. It collectively is what archaeologists call woodland pottery. But it, the different styles we see here represent uh, regional differences as well as in time as well. So, either I got to get a smaller thumb or I got to get a bigger button here. Okay. Uh, this type right here with the castellated uh, lips and so forth is roughly about three, four hundred years before Europeans arrived. Whereas this piece right here, and this one as well, uh, we're looking at about a thousand years before uh, Europeans arrived. And this one right here uh, is a type of pottery that's been found outside of the effigy mound area uh, up in this portion right here. And that's about five, six hundred years before Europeans arrived. The pottery is tempered with crushed, either crushed rock, uh, sandstone, or fired pottery that's broke up and crushing up and mixing in with the with the temp to temper it to strengthen it and so forth so it could be take heat stress and other types of cold stress as well <clears throat> and it's fairly rare to find whole vessels you can see right here I keep forgetting this is over here <laughs> you can see right here uh, this one has been was probably found uh, largely you know, broken up, and it was um, pasted back together. And this one's got some fracture lines in it as well. And then some of it's been reconstructed uh, as well. And there you can see where it's been reconstructed. So these vessels range in size from being about maybe eight inches in height to about me at the most 14 inches in height. <clears throat> and um, here is a little bit more of a pointed bottom. So, uh, but as you get more closer to the historic period, you get more rounded bottoms uh, to vessels. Exactly why, I don't know. And anyone who's an expert, I've never asked them about it, to be honest with you. Now then, the effigy mounds. <laughs> there are three basic types. Although there is, you probably heard of the man mound that's over by Baraboo, yeah, that. Uh, there's about two or three of those that have been documented. Um, and there's also uh, rare but other types of figures uh, that are not exactly readily interpreted, uh, but they are definitely man-made mounds. And I think there's still about two or three what are called intaglios. Uh, it's not a mound, but it's basined out, shaped like a mound. And there's one, let's see, uh, Highway 26, I'm trying to think. Uh, where is the city that has the uh, cabaret? Uh, huh? Yeah, Fort Atkinson. There's one in Fort Atkinson uh, on what would be the boulevard of someone's house. And they've taken a lot of work, I think, to preserve that mound. Yeah. But it's an intaglio. And I, you have to kind of look for it. I, I can't remember if there are any signs for you to go come and look at it and so forth. Yeah. But the basic, besides the conical mounds and somewhat oblong mounds, and they're also linear, long linear mounds, uh, the effigy forms uh, have attracted a lot of attention. And there are three basic forms. Birds, what are simply called an animal of some type. And then what archaeologists used to call a panther. Uh, but um, the archaeologist Robert Hall, uh, who uh, his mother was Native American. He's from Green, he was from Green Bay. He died about 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, he started studying this very thoroughly. And he's the one that pointed out that uh, he thinks they're water spirits. Uh, and uh, that they're, they're not an, a, a terrestrial type of animal. <laughs> and it's too bad he couldn't be here to speak about it. Uh, he was really one of the nicest people I ever met in the profession. Yeah. He'd bend over backwards to tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> really, a, really a real gentleman is, is how one of my professors referred to him as. So the effigy mound exists basically from here going across down here, a little bit into Illinois and a little bit into uh, Iowa and of course Minnesota as well. 
I think I have one more thing here. Right? Yes. If you've never been to Effigy Mounds National Monument, now is a good time of year to go. Uh, the fall, uh, it's in Iowa. You just go to Prairie du Chien, cross the river, head north. Yeah. And the mounds, uh, you're standing on ground basically like this, and you can walk over here and look down, and there's the Mississippi River right below you. Yeah. It's a beautiful area. Even if you're not interested in mounds, it's, <laughs> it's worth it to go to this, this place to see it. Yeah. And they're, they're preserved. And it was, the preservation of the uh, effigy mounds took place in the 1950s. And it solely was the work of one person for the most part, who was uh, basically, I think, in the Forest Service in Iowa. Uh, who led the charge on preserving this and putting them on the National Register of play, Historic Places. Another thing I want to point out is, you see the birds in this kind of yellow. Uh, the artist who reconstructed this, just to sort of the three, type, the three main types and uh, the general area. That, uh, in fact, about 90% of the birds that have been documented are not flying north. They're either flying south, southwest or southeast yeah. and i've never really sat down and did a mind thing about this you know, trying to figure out exactly why but there's a logic behind it especially if you find it all the way across the state yeah. uh, as a matter of fact um, i did my doctoral dissertation on a site whoops not that site <laughs> uh, right up here and what i looked at was two excavations, one from 48 and one from 72. I didn't do any field work there at all. And uh, on that terrace, it's called the Diamond Bluffs Terrace. It's about, um, 200, it's about uh, 220 acres. And it's kind of shaped like a cigar in a way. And it's facing to the northwest. Yeah. Uh, in 1885, uh, a surveyor archaeologist uh, mapped all the mounds there. And in his, and he, his name is Theodore Lewis, and I've looked through his field journals and so forth. All he has is these numbers of the mounds, their size, etc. Seldom does he ever write any commentary in them at all, you know. But at this place, he wrote one comment, which is really striking. He measured and plotted location of 396 mounds, and then he wrote this comment: at least 150 are two. Torn, worn down or plowed down to worth bothering to uh, map. So on 220 acres, he estimated there were close to 600 mounds that had been built in this area. And then right across the river is Red Wing, and that had hundreds of mounds in that area uh, as well. So uh, even these early people, some of them were very careful in mapping all this stuff and uh, trying to preserve it in many ways. Although I read about Lewis, he was apparently a very cantankerous person. He didn't like the Irish, he didn't like the Catholics, he didn't like the Protestants, he didn't like city folk, <laughs> you name it, <laughs> on his list. He didn't trust anybody either, yeah, but uh, nonetheless, I guess that's why he was a bachelor all his life. Now, the reason why I'm showing you this stuff is Wisconsin and Native Americans in general live in a, lived in, and still do, of course, but lived in a much larger sphere. Yeah. It wasn't simply all local or regional, like the effigy mounds and so on. And one of the central places in North America that had access to many parts of North, what is North America, especially what is now the contiguous United States, is across the river from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and the name of the site is Cahokia. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is referred to as the Mississippian period. You clearly at Cahokia, all the evidence of the types of artifacts, the mound building that took place, et cetera, um, uh, is representative of a fairly, not a fairly, a complex society with social hierarchies, uh, of which we can use that term chief uh, as the person in charge. And based on what anthropologists have studied about chieftains in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, one of the best examples is the Hawaiian chieftain, uh, is that they live in lineage groups. In other words, they're kin, they're all identified, 
either through marriage or through birth. But these groups are the competing, we'll say, political parties. And so they'll jockey to get these positions. <clears throat> and that theory and model has been used to try to understand what took place at Cahokia. So these chieftains collected tribute, food, exotic materials, managed distribution of food supplies, oversaw political relations, warfare, notably. There's a lot of evidence of warfare imagery, and I'll show you some examples. Authority steeped in symbolism. <laughs> and of course, we see that today. Uh, um, authority is steeped in symbolism. No matter what it is, there is symbolism that goes with, that says, I'm in charge, and so forth. And a strong connection to ancestors as well, uh, seems to have been. So Cahokia, which we'll be looking at, is located right here. Yeah. And uh, we have related groups, but not as socially complex. If you've ever been in the state park of Astalan, has anyone ever been there? It just had their 50th anniversary, I think, of being a state park. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a really neat place to go as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Red Wing, there is also uh, at least two platform mounds found at Red Wing. That's one of the very symbolic things about the Mississippians, you know, building these platform mounds. Uh, and at Trempolo, there's one as well. And I'll show you a picture of that a little bit later here. But all these other groups that are mentioned, and their basic, their territories, you know, uh, were in symbolically uh, part of this whole big system but they had their regional identities, is what it comes down to. And it's based by looking at the styles of pottery uh, and other forms of symbolism, uh, et cetera. Uh, but uh, the largest of all these uh, was Cahokia. Yeah. Oh, that was easy. Just had to pull it out of my pocket. Yeah. Excuse me, one yeah. question. The southern uh, group that was in the Louisiana area? Yeah. Oops. The name, the Palenque, or is that? Yeah, Palenque, pl pl Plaquemine, Plaquemine, I think, yeah. Right, yeah. so was that related to the Mayans on the other side of the Gulf of Mexico? There's no direct evidence for that, but <laughs> at this site, this Spiro, a number of years ago, was found a fragment about the size of a baseball, kind of a chunk, of green obsidian. And you can chemically trace it, and it goes right to the Valley of Mexico. So there is probably some down-the-line trade. Uh, or to put it maybe as simply as possible, these people will say knew about those people. They have the same name as the Mexican flag, the Tolkien. The Tolkien flag. Yeah. 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 Yes. And, and that's contemporary, not 8,900 to about 1,100. The Totecs existed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there is also, just to digress, before the Totecs, uh, the great city of Teotihuacan, a huge city uh, that probably had about over 300,000 people in it. Yeah. And one of the things that Teotihuacan possessed and guarded and saw as potential economic wealth as the Totex and then subsequently the Aztecs was the great um, obsidian quarries uh, that were on, I think, the northeast side of the valley. <clears throat> so uh, raw materials pays off. <laughs> you can control it. So Cahokia, I've been here several times. I've never worked there, but I've had colleagues who who worked there and uh, would say, if you're not doing anything, you know, towards the end of summer, come on down, we could, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> so, this is an artist reconstruction, this is an artist reconstruction of Cahokia Center, right here. This is the largest mound ever constructed north of Mexico City, or Mex the Valley of Mexico. It's called Monk's Mound. There used to be a little colony of Trappist monks that had a little church right here uh, in the, uh, I believe it was the 16th century or the 17th century. They didn't stay very long, only about two years, because a lot of this land was quite wet, marshy, and that uh, 
they started catching malaria. <laughs> uh, and so they abandoned it. <laughs> Nonetheless, Monk's Mound uh, is a little over, at this end, 100 feet in height. Okay? And uh, it covers about 16 acres altogether. Okay? And how was it built? Basket loads of dirt. <clears throat> and so uh, thinking about this, there could have been individuals who said they were doing it. My father worked on this as well. It wasn't built overnight. Now, this is the really neat stuff about it. And that is, I have a really good friend who's just retired. Uh, we went to graduate school together. Uh, he went and got a PhD in geology because he is interested in soils. And that's how he made his career, uh, career by doing soil probes for archaeologists. And, uh, very successful little business, just him and one other person. Yeah. Uh, and the only way they advertise by word of mouth. Yeah. <clears throat> and Mike's just a really great guy. <laughs> Over at this end here, oops, I should be using, the mound was, is beginning to slump a little bit. Now, it's thought that the mound was probably completed uh, roughly about 1150 AD about that time period. So uh, it's a National Register Park, et cetera. And I'm just going to say, if you ever, here's the interstate right here. Oops. From Collinsville to St. Louis. And you'll see it if you drive by it. If you drive off, there's a state-of-the-art museum that's about, now about 15 years old. Uh, it's, free to get into, it's free to get into the whole place. Yeah. And you can take the steps and go up here. Uh, four major building episodes. The first platform, then that platform, and then this platform, and then right here, the fourth platform. And there was, there was some excavations that were done here uh, in the 19, uh, early 50s. And what they found was the re they went down through two layers, found the remains of big houses that had been burnt. And we go to the analogy of the Nat, and I'm going to come to the Natchez just briefly a little bit here towards the end. Uh, the, the Natchez uh, had a similar type society, although we know about them historically. And when the leader or chief, or whatever the title would be, uh, died, the house would be burnt down and be built over. So it's roughly four or five hundred years before the Natchez, but nonetheless a similar type of strategy. There was also a palisade that was built, oops, <laughs> built around this main portion of Cahokia. <clears throat> it, it, the palisade encompasses about over about 220 acres. <clears throat> and there are actually three building episodes. And the last one is where they put in these huge posts about the diameter of a telephone pole. And it must have been a big work gang that systematically really did this because uh, about 30 years ago, a graduate student from uh, University of Illinois was going to do his thesis on a house that was found partially. And he excavated the house, exposed the floor. And what he found in the house was some copper, some marine shell, uh, and a copper is a pretty good chunk of it. It had been beaten down, uh, rain shell, and I can't remember a few other things. And he thought about this for a moment because the, sta the palisade went right through the house. And he came to the conclusion that they weren't just building this palisade, you know, like, let's go out in the morning, a couple of us put up a pole. They had these work gangs that were just cranking this out because they dug a big trench through it, put the poles in, buried it in, and so forth and so forth. When I one of my professors, who did a lot of work here in this area, I asked him one time, if Koki is so big and powerful, why would they build <laughs> a palisade? You know, uh, and he said, well, yeah, you're right, they're big and powerful, but their enemies live right nearby in the valley. And this is the valley that he was talking about right here. Yeah. <clears throat> this is the Missouri River coming in, Mississippi. In a very distant time in the past, 
uh, the rivers, when they merged, had different channels. And they gouged out uh, a lot of this area right here. These oxbow lakes are old, old channels from the river. Uh, and what takes place uh, is as the river uh, keeps eroding and pushing it out, like here, it eventually eliminates this and it breaks through. It probably was down here where it took place, breaks through, and it creates a new channel. Sometime, if you're interested, go to uh, on the web and look for images uh, in the lower Mississippi Valley aerial photography of Oxbow Lakes. It's amazing. It's quite amazing. Uh, the river is very dynamic. It's much different up here uh, in Wisconsin, Minnesota. Than it is different. Oh, I, I'm certain there have been, yes, yeah. It's been used a lot now. Uh, it, it helps minim, eliminate or minimize any excavation to do that. Ground penetrating radar as well has been used. The only problem is you gotta have the money <laughs> to afford it. Yeah. And believe me, this is a profession which you don't, <laughs> you don't end up on Wall Street, is what it comes down to. Now, <laughs> Oops, keep doing that, don't I? Uh, at Cahokia, uh, I'm going to show you something else here too, but Cahokia is located <laughs> yeah, right, there, right here. Okay. This is what's called the East St. Louis site. There was a large site where the city of St. Louis is right now. There are only two mounds left in the city of St. Louis, and they're both on private property. And I saw one while taking the interstate through here one time. It was in the southern part of uh, St. Louis. And the person who was riding with me said, OK, you'll see it here any minute. And it was like about a half of a city block away from the interstate. And there was this house sticking up. And it was a platform mound. This modern house had been built on. But there had been a large mound group uh, in St. Louis. And there are some photos from the 1860s of them breaking down the mounds and carting that dirt away. <laughs> in part to fill in the area along the river. Because a lot of this was swamp uh, wetlands along the river, not this nice neat bank uh, that we think of if you've been to St. Louis. The East St. Louis site right here is in a very low elevation. And they did one of the same things. They brought in soil, uh, truncated the tops of the mounds, and filled it all in. If you've been to St. Louis or know anything about East St. Louis, it's a very impoverished community. And um, I can't think of this guy's name now. He's at Washington U. Um, he, all he does is he doesn't teach. He just runs the archaeology lab, and he's excavated a lot. St. Louis was, East St. Louis was so desperate for money. One of the things they did was they stopped using the stoplights. No more stoplights. They wanted to save money on electricity. And then they started selling parts of the city. Now this archaeologist, he had this map uh, that was made right about as the city was being built. And it showed where the mounds were. And he knew exactly where they were, but he knew they were covered up. And so the city started selling lots. And he told me, he goes, hey, I just bought a, I met him at a conference. I don't know him that well, but he's saying, I just, I just bought part of East St. Louis. I said, you know, get out of here. I said, it must be pretty cheap. He goes, yeah, it's this half a city block. And it's just got remnants of this old building that was made out of wood. I got that torn down. I said, why'd you buy it? He goes, because there's a platform mound buried there. And so with his own money, for the most part, initially, he identified this mound, cleaned it up, and so forth. And I haven't seen him now for years, but I think he was investigating other cheap lots in East St. Louis and trying the best he can to kind of reconstruct what the community was like. Yeah. <clears throat> Another person I know, Tom Emerson, who ran a lot of the, as an archaeologist, the DOT projects with the interstate system here. I was talking to him a few years ago. Well, actually, it's been, time flies too fast. It's got to be about 15 years ago. The new interstate system that Illinois, or the federal government was putting in through here, the upgrading of it, 
they got to do all this survey, archaeologists got to do all this survey along that corridor. And what they found out was because of all the pottery that was found at Cahokia's height, about 1150 and so forth, it wasn't just this. It was one huge occupation that went right to East St. Louis all along here. So there used to be debates that uh, how many people lived at Cahokia? Well, at the low end, 10,000. At the high end, 60,000. But everyone was just looking at the time, because it was what was available, was just this right here. Oh, no one thought it'd be anything like that. A huge population. So what happened to it, Cahokia? Why, why was it abandoned eventually? Or there's just a remnant group that was living there? I think they basically destroyed their own environment, uh, cutting down trees, et cetera. Uh, they basically had an urban area. Uh, now, we can find deer in our urban areas, uh, but at least we try to let them go or not shoot them or kill them, right, in, in, in the city? Yeah. But uh, the thinking is that uh, they just, their economy, to put it simply, expired in the way of life. And that the peoples that were left basically left for other places and spread out. You know. So uh, a huge area. And again, if you ever get the chance to go there, if you're going to go see the Cubs play the Cardinals, <laughs> don't go. The Cardinals will win. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, go to Cahokia. It's free to get in, and it's really worth it. And it's been a while now since I've been there, but on the highway, On the highway from Cahokia that goes to Collinsville, uh, on the road, it's a road, the inter not the interstate, but the, this road right here. If you keep following it going east, you'll come to where it ends and the highway divides and you go north or south. Where that divide triangle is, there's a wonderful Mexican restaurant there. <laughs> so, But before I move on, any questions about this? Oh, I should mention the pottery. Yeah, I'm sorry. These are the various styles of pottery through time, right here. Yeah. And the pottery is made, except with some exceptions in this earlier group here, the pottery is made not with crushed grit or sand as temper, but with clam shell. And what is done, apparently, what is thought to be done the clamshell is baked on a fire. It makes it fragile. You break up into small pieces. And then you mix it in with the clay. Yeah. And what the clamshell does, it strengthens the walls. And you can, and I've seen some of these vessels uh, that have been reconstructed, but huge, stand up about this high. They maybe hold about six, seven gallons yeah, of liquid. The walls are thin. They're more durable than the grit-tempered ones. And then furthermore, by cooking in them, because the shell isn't buried all entirely within, around the sides, yeah, someone figured out that people are probably getting some calcium intake from that. So whether they knew it or not, yeah, uh, it was also basically healthy to eat, be eating out of a device like that. Yeah. Uh, but it's a very interesting technological innovation. It, bigger vessels, thinner walls, stronger vessels as well. <clears throat> now, here's another fascinating thing about Cahokia. <laughs> In the 1960s, um, uh, an archaeologist that worked at the University of Illinois, uh, they were doing some excavation around here, and they came upon a stain in the ground where a post had been. And then someone else nearby, just about 20 feet or so, found another stain. And if that first stain was here, the other one was not literally in a straight line. It was a little bit off to here. So what he did was, 
he started just clearing off the surface without going deep. And he discovered there was a circle of host. What he discovered was the first of the 48 posts of 410 foot diameter is what it came out, complete. He then discovered there was one that had 24 posts, 36 posts. And after he retired, his work was carried on, the next person found evidence of 60 posts. And then the largest group, they couldn't count out 72 because right beyond here is private property, big chain link fence, it's a trucking business. Divisible by 12. It's thought to be a calendar. However, one of my professors agreed with that, but also said it's an allidade. I'll show you what. Here it is, right here, a reconstruction. Mike Fowler, who is one of my professors, he was trained as an engineer and get, did a lot of drafting. So for a period of time, well, a few months long before I came along, he did some little experiments. Right here is a mound on top of Monk's Mound. And I got to stand back to see. Oh, this small nondescript mound right here. He drew a straight line through here. And he found out he could match up lines to things. And they're in the shapes of triangles and so forth. Right here, we see these two mounds. One's a conical, one's a temple-type mound. This is not very good. But uh, there is another one over here, well, facing the, kind of a line this direction. And there's another one over here, a line this direction. This is a planned out community. So he had his graduate student, Elizabeth Benchley, excavate here. And she found a huge stain beneath that little mound. And he went down here and excavated where his line went through this, not, as he said, it's some small nondescript mound. It's actually about maybe 70 feet long and about 10 feet in height. Did a little excavation there, a big stain. So there's a huge post that was put in here and one here. And he's now deceased, but he would talk about saying, there's probably got to be others around. But one of the keys was this right here. Now, I don't know which one this is supposed to represent. I'm kind of guessing maybe the 72 or the 60 post. But during the equinox, when the sun comes up, it aligns right with the center pole. So something that looks simple to us was actually, can I say, a library of information. <laughs> OK, the poles are the shadow. The sun rises a line. We have to start thinking along these lines, doing this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It is really quite remarkable, yeah. given that for a long time, Euro, Euro Americans, many of them, didn't think Native Americans did anything much at all. Yeah. <clears throat> But instead, the largest populated area in North America at one time lasted for about 350 years, approximately. <clears throat> and maybe someone attacked them. I don't know. <laughs> in answering my original question uh, that I gave to Mike Fowler. A, a question. Yeah. Were there roads, any roads identified emanating from the center going out to an agricultural zone? Or how was the uh, city of 60,000 supported? Oh, uh, well, definitely agricultural. Yeah, a lot of maize was growing. Yeah, a lot of maize was growing. And there was, of course, some hunting and fishing as well, especially in those uh, dead channels, you know, fishing and, and evidence of eating turtles, uh, deer. But probably the deer issue, you know, uh, I'm, I'm only guessing, but that didn't last the whole 350 years unless you're really going out somewhere. Yeah. <clears throat> but uh, 
and also most likely importing dried foods as well uh, because uh, as, as tribute or as trade as trade <clears throat> one of the things that uh, it's not simply Native Americans did this but there are other groups as well yeah. but you'd have these big rendezvous and um, I can't remember the name of this person I only met him once but he got his degree in Milwaukee about 15 years before I came. But he wrote his thesis on trade and exchange amongst Plains Indians. And what he found was, and then he, after he got that, he kind of investigated other peoples as well. If you're going to trade, let's just say you have a container of corn. So I want to trade this, and I'm going to give it to Billy Bob. And Billy Bob gives me a container of corn. It's not what is being traded. It's that you're trading. You're active. And this has been found in other places of the world uh, as well. I'm just going to digress for a moment. When I taught uh, an introduction to cultural anthropology, I used to use this paper called um, Too Many Bananas. And it's about this anthropologist. He's uh, doing his dissertation work and his wife is, and they go to this small island in the Sullivan Islands in the Pacific. And the leader of the village takes him to this hut because, and it had a, um, a porch that was raised up in that place and said, uh, you know, this is where you're staying and let me know if you need anything. And he said after about 20 minutes, uh, this person comes with a bunch of bananas uh, and said, I thought I'd give you bananas for you and your, your two children and so forth. And he said, yeah, oh, thank you very much. Uh, see what can I give you so he, he and his wife had brought newspapers and tobacco and people could roll their own cigarettes yeah. and then pretty soon uh, like the next morning someone else comes with bananas and he said we already got these bananas here well, I end up on the veranda having all these bananas <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, some of them are rotting and they're, and they're getting tired of eating bananas and so forth and this one person came with bananas and he said no don't want them don't get out of here, go. And the person came back with the head man of the community, and the head man took him aside. He said, what are you doing? And he said to him, oh, he's bananas. You know? He goes, that's the whole idea. Uh, you don't have to eat them. You, this is how we establish our relationships. Yeah? And so other peoples around the world have done this as well. And certainly that was going on from this colleague who did a Plains Indian study, because he had historic records, and it's been going on all along. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's establishing the relationship that is more important than what you're exchanging. Yeah. Reciprocity is basically the word for it. Yeah. <clears throat> it's a good question, though. I wish you'd take a class from me while I'm retired, because I seldom would get questions like that. <laughs> Now then, up in Wisconsin, have you ever been to Aslan State Park? We talked about it a little briefly, yeah. Uh, it was built during the height of Cahokia. And um, the pottery that's been found there, especially along the river where the garbage was dumped, uh, uh, is mostly this Mississippian pottery. And a lot of it, through a type of analysis called thin section analysis, uh, came directly from the American bottom. Yeah. There is uh, local pottery mixed in with it, forms of woodland pottery, refer to it. Yeah. But the people who build it, here's a map from, I think, uh, Increased Lapham made this map yeah. in the uh, 1850s. It had a palisade around it, constructed in the same fashion with guard posts, you know, uh, here. Uh, it's been reconstructed using old telephone poles, <laughs> uh, power line poles, yeah. and uh, uh, platform mount here, platform mount here, another platform mount here, and this big knoll right here, uh, which was natural but probably used uh, for some connection in the social agenda, yeah. right along the Crawfish River. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it existed for roughly about 200 years at the most. But clearly, it was people who had come up from the American bottom and settled there. 
And then in Trempeleau, Wisconsin, is this mound. And if you go to Trempeleau and you're coming into the town and you get to a point where the highway heads north or you turn, take a left and go right down to the river where the Trempeleau Hotel is and so forth, where you're making that turn going north, you'll go, you'll see a big knoll and there's a motel there. There's a ridge overlooking that motel and it's on this ridge. And the person who discovered it, name's George Squire. His father was a Baptist minister and got the calling to leave West Salem, Wisconsin to go to Trempolo. <laughs> and they bought the farm. Right below was their farm, which this was on the property. And his father plowed a portion of it for a while, but it's too much work, not a waste of time to get up there because it's very narrow sides. Yeah. And so George preserved it. And um, he was training to be a geologist, but he also liked the idea of archaeology. And he only, when he was challenged about by some people, he only made about four corings of, into the soil with an auger that's about two inches in diameter. Uh, to see if he could come up with some proof uh, that it was real. And it is real. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, unfortunately, he died in Kansas City at a very elderly age. And uh, about, the, about 10 years after he died in Kansas City near his son, the village of Tremplow built a water tower up here. And there are letters from uh, the Milwaukee Public Museum, notably, because uh, the two archaeologists that knew about this, they wanted to save this. They wrote letters saying, you know, can't you build it further back, etc. cetera. And, uh, also, beyond the big platform here, when you go down the slope, there are two big holes that are about maybe the length of what, from here to the wall, and there's a walkway down the center. That's where the soil came to build the mounds. <clears throat> so it's preserved. Uh, and so if you ever go to Trempolo, grab yourself a beer and, and go up and look at the mounds. You can get up there. Yeah. <clears throat> Is anybody looked at excavating that? Uh, there was a partial excavation where that overlapped where the water tower had been. Yeah. Uh, so, and because of the water tower's disturbance, they were looking, let's just say that hole is right, was right here. They were on the, uh, would be the, the north side. They wanted to get a look at the soil profile. They were going to remove that fill that had been dumped in there. Um, and so they wanted to uh, see what the soil profile was. And that, um, I never have seen the results. I know they've published on it, but I just have not, yeah. yeah. I noticed they um, yeah. mowed, they mow now by the ground, the mounds. Yeah. Like, way back when, what did they? Do they, do they just to keep it clear, or do we know? I think, remember, mounds are not only the present, but they're an identity. The mounds have stories associated with them. But I'm going to guess that the Native Americans that built the mounds, unless the mounds was like within an active community right there, they would just let nature take over. Or they would um, visit mounds, and probably do something to put a memorial on the mound or something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, but it's a good question, yeah. Because the only way I've ever seen, oh, I did see some mounds that were in the Black River River bottoms, right north of La Crosse. Uh, and it was all wooded and they were overgrown, but I could see that there were mounds that were there. Yeah. That was a long time ago. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes. In Lapp Lappin's book, he showed a lot of mounds that were in Fulton. Yeah. And it's, I was driving around. <laughs> I, I'm like, where could they be? And and a lot of them on the Rock River, and I'm thinking, well, if I, you know they were there, and I'm thinking, well, maybe I need to get in a boat to see them. <laughs> but are they gone? I have no or, idea. Okay. I hope not. But yeah. yeah. Does anyone know? His book is amazing. It's it here in the library, and, and so 
what's this what about 1860s 1870s or something oh, uh, that, it was like the late 18 i think it was published in 1852. okay yeah. and so he's going around this whole area and he's drawing what he's seeing and so i was trying to find him <laughs> yeah there's a biography i was written about him about six years ago uh, he was quite a remarkable person. He was self-trained a lot, but he argued to save the mounds. He was one of the first to really say that. You know. is, is the mound culture mostly concentrated in the Mississippi Valley, or it, did it extend at all to the Iroquois areas back east in New um, York? Or what was, and also kind of what was the origin? Did it come from North America to Central America or vice versa? Well, if I had to answer that question, <laughs> some of the very earliest mounds, um, there are, some of the earliest ones have been found in New England, but there are not very many of them. In part, the reason why, because when they were excavated, it was like in the mid 19th century, and notes were taken and stuff like that, and in comparison to what was taking place in the latter part of the 19th century and into the early 20th century implied that, uh, uh, and then some of the things found in the mounds, not necessarily artifacts, but uh, remains of fish or something in that order. But the mounds weren't characteristic of the Iroquois. No, no, they weren't, no, no. Uh, no, they weren't. It's not until you get into the Ohio, well, I'll say the Mississippi drainage, uh, where they become prolific. Yeah. And there are, uh, not so much to the south. It goes into Oklahoma a little bit, and maybe, uh, well, Louisiana, but maybe far close eastern Texas. You know, uh, and it does go into the eastern part of the plains along the Missouri River. There's mounds and in Iowa, et cetera. So is there any evidence of communication between, say, the lower in Louisiana and the Mayans? Not that I've read. Yeah, um, like I said a little bit earlier, most likely they heard stories, and I mentioned that one example of the obsidian that was found, uh, uh, that implies a trade network, but it certainly, most likely, I think, and I, I tend to agree along with the thing is, it was a down the line trade. You know? The person from the, uh, the, the base of Mexico who traded someone else had no idea where it was going. <laughs> you know. And I always wonder what they got in return. <laughs> but yeah, it's a good question. Uh, uh, there's, I, I tend to think of Wisconsin and a little bit of Minnesota, uh, but especially Wisconsin because of its river systems and where they start and end as at the apex of two great waterways. It's like you're up there at the corner Hmm. Should I go down the Mississippi or should I take the uh, St. Croix River and do that short portage to the Brule and get in the Lake Superior? Or should I go down and uh, go into the Wisconsin River and go with that portage to you know, the Fox River? And so it's, uh, the more I've kind of read through that and thought about it, it really is an amazing location, uh, this part of the North America. And there's nothing else like the Great Lakes in the, in the rest of the world. There's just nothing comparable at all. And just from a cultural perspective, did the Wisconsin people that settled here predate the Eastern Native populations or contemporary? Well, uh, from a migration from the Ice Ages. Yeah. Matter of fact, just not too long ago, I don't know if you saw this in the paper in the Southwest. I can't remember what the uh, what the ground. There was no ground cover, but they found footprints, um, and uh, also the footprints of the of the giant land sloth as well. Uh, and I don't know what dating method to use, but they're estimating now about 20,000 years ago. Uh, when I was in graduate school, it was 15,000 years ago. <laughs> and I suspect that there's going to be more evidence uh, of even earlier occupations. There's a famous site in, in Chile on the coast, in southern Chile coast there, Monte Verde. And it was found by, it's a peat bog is what it was, but farmer cutting peat for fuel. And I can't remember what he came upon, but uh, when it was excavated, they found um, uh, 
I can't remember exactly, it's been so long since I've read about it, but several set items were dated by radiocarbon dating, and they all clustered to around 16,000 years ago. So if you're in southern Chile, and there's a consensus that uh, at one time, long time ago, uh, indigenous peoples from Siberia filtered into what is now Alaska. And as I tell students, you know, they didn't sort of wake up one morning and go, hey, let's go to Alaska. <laughs> Most likely, it was all following game, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that it's going to be pushed back sometime uh, even earlier. But from a language flow, yeah. the Algonquin and Iroquois languages moved westward, not uh, vice versa. Uh, well, the, or what was this a more? The Algonquin language is quite widespread. Now, the Iroquois language, the Iroquois language is linked to the Cherokee uh, in the southeast. And some scholars think that, uh, that have studied it, have that the Cherokee, uh, sector, portions of them at one time or various times moved into upstate New York, yeah. put it simply. And then, of course, there's the Huron, they're Iroquois speakers and all those others I mentioned as well. Yeah. So it's a fairly large language family, but... But there's no languages that predate these in Wisconsin? Uh, not that we know of, yeah. Um, not that I have ever read, and I'll be honest with you, I never read a whole lot on linguistics. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, I have read some from a historical perspective of the people who study the linguistics. And uh, anthropology did a big linguistics push at the end, by the end of the 19th century because languages were disappearing. Uh, matter of fact, I think it was the linguist, was his last name Mahoney or Money, I can't remember. There was a Navajo joke about him, uh, not, no, a Hopi joke about him because he learned a lot from the Navajo or neighbors. And the Hopi joke is, what's a, what is a uh, uh, Navajo family? There's a man, there's a woman, there's a children, and they're anthropologists. <laughs> but it was all directed towards saving languages, recording whatever could be recorded, yeah. and eventually using wax cylinders you know, to record those. And those are, many of them are preserved at the Smithsonian, because yeah. languages are very dynamic. You know, they're always being stimulated, changed, and so forth. So what yeah. languages they uh, speak in the capital area there of St. Louis? Uh, I, if, I, that, I, I can't say specifically, but it might be some variant of Algonquin because um, the Illinois Indians are Algonquin speakers. But again, their form of Algonquin, you may not be able to go to Eastern Canada and talk to someone. I gave the example, of course, like English and German you know, and so forth. Uh, yeah, the Algonquin language is fairly widespread in the Northeast <coughs> uh, in various dialects uh, and so forth. But the thing is, uh, languages, I'm not being flippant here, but don't fossilize, you know. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> the two oldest languages that have script, the Sumerian cuneiform and the Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, actually the clues to break in those was that the Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, were written in the traditional Egyptian, uh, in Greek, and I can't remember what the, oh, I can't remember what the, the other one was. And the Greek one could be read and said, what's being said here in Greek is what the other thing is saying as a monument during the Ptolemaic period. And the Sumerians um, also, uh, uh, trying to think, the Persian emperor Xerxes uh, I had this, what, one of my colleagues who studied this, uh, still teaching, uh, this big billboard, but it was all in stone. Uh, and it's in southeastern Iran. And in part the Elamites. The Elamites, right? Yes. And they just, that's and one they of just the languages. To yeah. Translate that. Yeah. That's one of the languages on there. Yeah. And basically, it's the same thing in three different scripts. Yeah. And I can't remember who the British uh, uh, ambassador at large. He's the one that he, his story is interesting. He had some guides take him. He had to go up the top and repel off of there. And he writes that on some occasions the locals are shooting. Hot shots at him while he's walking in. The lengths that people will go to. <laughs> but those are good questions, and I just don't have.
good answers for them, and so forth. But, uh, oh, yeah, that's fine. So the Mississippi is a, a highway trade network <clears throat> that the site of demarcation on, I never saw this, I know it's being preserved at the Minnesota Museum of Natural History or whatever, uh, this masquette, it's only about an inch or so big. Yeah. But <clears throat> here is a person in a boat on the river, yeah. and he's adorned with uh, some sort of headdress, uh, his ears are pierced uh, with a big lobe there, a lot of symbolism in this as well. But one of the most startling discoveries was made in an unfortunate circumstance at the <clears throat> large mound at Spiro. <clears throat> the reason why I say it's unfortunate, it survived, it's in a private collection, and it's about this big, and it's a purse, a male sitting there with his legs crossed. Yeah. Uh, it was safely removed after dynamiting one of the mounds to get into them. <clears throat> and unfortunately, the person who owns it, or the family that owns it, has let scholars come in and study it. And it's a pipe. Uh, the stem came out back here, and the bowl is up here. And it's <clears throat> made out of uh, kind of a bauxite in a way. Uh, or I'm trying to think what the other would be. Kind of a soft stone, but you could carve it and then smooth it down. Yeah. He has a big, what is most likely a copper plate here is a dress, and he has one of these ears, one on each side. Yeah. These god maskets as they're referred to. Yeah. And here are some examples right here. Yeah. And I'll see what the next one I got here. And they're thought to have been symbolic of traitors. And what is interesting about this, besides the maskets themselves, is that with the only exception I'm aware of, <clears throat> there are remnants of two copper masks from Astolan. But beyond that, if you took a line and drew it straight across here, all the other masks that are known in the north are made of marine shell, and all the ones in the south are made of copper. And where was that copper coming from? Well, maybe in some places here, but has anyone ever been to, uh, what is the, it's a national park? Not the Kiowa Peninsula, but the island that's, I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. oh, island Royale. Every late prehistoric pottery style of, the, of this region right here has been found on Isle Royale along with the copper mines as well, <laughs> and the wolves, <laughs> and in addition to that. So, and when I started learning this stuff, I was just jaw dropping. <clears throat> People traveled, they interacted, they exchanged things. So despite their regional differences, or their conflicts, or whatever, they shared in something that was quite amazing throughout this region, as well as other regions, as well in North America. And again, it's thought that um, these were symbols of traitors. Now there is a um, Aztec god who has a long nose. <laughs> and the Aztec traitors would go well beyond the empire of the Aztecs uh, into Central America. And even there's some suggested in the American Southwest. Uh, the skeleton, I think, of in one excavation of a macaw was found. Yeah. And some rubber was found as well. Yeah. Uh, the, Meso, the Mesoamericans played a, a ball game with rubber ball, uh, a ball that would be about this size. And it was quite brutal, apparently. Uh, you couldn't use your hands. You only could use your shoulders or your hips or head to move the ball. And the Spanish observed it, and they said that uh, once the te a, a team won, and scholars think that all it took was one score. <laughs> they weren't running up the scoreboard at all. But what the Spanish observed was as soon as the game was won, and won, all the people fled. And what was taking place is that the ball players of the winning team were chasing down people, and if you caught them, you could have all their possessions on them. Yeah. 
<laughs> so presumably some of them went home in the buff is what it took place. If you don't mind my digressing, you know, the game was also played in uh, very southern Mexico by uh, the uh, late Maya. Uh, is it Chichen Itza, I think is the name of the site? Uh, but there, there's iconography of the, if not the captain of the, of the losing team, but the entire team being sacrificed after the game. Yeah, so. <laughs> so it's a pretty rough sport uh, for some. Now, about the mounds, I'll try to speed up here a little bit. But the question was asking, you know, where are the mounds found, basically? And this is a map, not that it's, I, everyone was mapped on here, but just from looking at general areas, uh, this is about from the 1890s, uh, uh, where mounds could be found. So uh, the Mississippi uh, River system had mounds in those valleys, et cetera. But, uh, not very many on the eastern side of the Appalachians. So the Louisiana Purchase, as I said, in 1803 and you know, War of 1812 ended in 1815. The government, federal government, opened up all this land and people started flooding into it. People had no idea there were mounds or a lot of them. And what emerged from this is what is known as the myth of the mound builders. Uh, Thousands of these mounds, I, I said here, uh, uh, in river valleys from the Appalachian to the Mississippi and tributes, uh, tributaries. Yeah. The question arose many people, who built the mounds? Yeah. Who built these? Yeah. <clears throat> and certainly, it couldn't have been the lazy Indians that you see uh, hanging around, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth. Yeah. <clears throat> now, we know from records that some of this was being promoted by land speculators. Yeah government officials as well, uh, et cetera. And even um, some of the early archaeologists wouldn't accept that. They, they thought for certain that the Native Americans had built the mounds. But it got to a point where this myth of the mound builders, and it lasted from roughly all about 18, 42, about 1890s. And it's becoming so serious that the federal government told the Bureau of Ethnology or the Smithsonian, where it was housed, uh, that you need uh, to investigate this uh, because it's causing a whole bunch of serious issues. So who built the mounds from the myth period? Well, basically, you can pick anybody, and uh, most likely they were part of doing it. But some of the better known types of groups that are presumably built all the mounds in North America uh, were the Phoenicians, who we know were sea travelers, yeah. uh, the Chinese. <laughs> uh, and actually, in the uh, 15th century, the Chinese, uh, if the government decided no more exploration voyages, you know, we're so important the world can come to us. And so they intentionally cut off that. But probably a few decades, if that had gone on, they would have made contact on the west coast of North America. But nonetheless, the lost tribes of Israel, the Greeks, the Celts, uh, the Norse Vikings. Well, we know the Vikings were here. Yeah. <clears throat> That's certain. But they didn't make much of an impact at all. Yeah. <clears throat> so this myth got to a point where this is a painting by John Egan. And it's in the St. Louis Art Museum. And it's huge. And if you ever get to St. Louis, you can go to the art museum because at least I think it was free, free to go in. Uh, and it's just huge. And one of the interesting things about this photo is uh, now Dr. Dickinson excavating. Uh, and most likely Dr. Dickinson didn't do any excavation because you can see who's doing the digging. Uh, his slaves, African-American slaves are doing it. Yeah. But one of the interesting aspects is there are some Native Americans right here. And they're just standing there, very passive, uh, as if um, it has nothing to do with us type of attitude. So I think that's very symbolic of the Native Americans. Their ancestors could not have built the mounds. It had to have been one of these others. So the federal government tells the, uh, oh, and here's the, I'm sorry, the rationale for the mound builder myth. 
some of the quote-unquote exotic artifacts that came from mounds. Yeah. This is mica. It's about eight inches long. It's a talon or a hawk's claw. This is from the Hopewell period right here. It's a pipe. Real beaver incisor. This was put in by the people, the museum, I think it, or I don't know who has possession now, but uh, after the fact, River Pearls has eyes in, in enamel teeth from a beaver in there. Though there was nothing in there was found, but it's a pipe, it was drilled all the way through, but you can see the artwork on it. Yeah. <clears throat> the one to the, uh, your right at the bottom, it's a pipe as well, and this person's playing a very popular game amongst Native Americans at the time, chunky. Uh, and you roll on a, on a paved area, well stopped down, hardened area of soil. You, one version is you'd roll it and uh, you'd predict where it would stop by trying to get it, you throw a spear, one version I've read, and you try to get it to stop as close to that. The other one was you'd roll it, then you'd try to throw a spear to hit it, etc. But it was quite popular uh, game. Uh, and it was being it was observed by Europe Euro Americans uh, at one time early on. Yeah. And then there's also this interesting. It's a woman with a baby. It's a nursing bottle. Yeah. You can see the little hole where the top is. Just four examples of the things that were thought to be Native Americans could never make this stuff. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, um, one of the arguments that uh, was given by the people who supported the mound builder uh, theory was uh, Native Americans were never seen using mounds or building them or anything like that. So it had to have been someone else that did it. But there was a lot of evidence available. And two of the most prominent types of evidence was the DeSoto expedition, uh, 1538, looking for lost cities of gold. Yeah. And to the best of all the knowledge, there is uh, at least one book that's still published um, uh, called the gentleman, uh, let's see, Florida of the Inca is what it's called. And I think it's uh, by the gentleman of Alvez was the author or something in that. Or, and he, or, he uh, interviewed some of the survivors. Uh, and other research has done, there's actually, a, the Spanish had a, had a trial or court thing in Cuba to figure out where all that money went that they spent to do this. <laughs> well, anyway, 1538, this is basically by the kinds of artifacts found. The, the route that uh, was taken uh, in the DeSoto exposition, expedition. Yeah. Uh, and finally, uh, they had like 600 pigs with them. Uh, it was families that went. Uh, there were about two or 300 men that were along. With it. And the things they ran into were quite fascinating. Uh, here, somewhere in Georgia, although some scholars think it was at this site right here, uh, the Etowa Mounds, but it's not clear. Yeah. There was a woman who was in charge, a queen, yeah. and uh, she tried to pay them off. You know, we don't really have anything here. Go on, you know. But uh, fighting broke out, and she was saved uh, by one of the Negro slaves that was with DeSoto. And of course, whether it's true or not, he went on to have a very good life <laughs> uh, for doing that. But the evidence is there, been found. Uh, they saw mounds. They even went into the mausoleums at the top of mounds, the Spanish did, and tore them down, etc., to destroy everything they could. And then there is uh, the death of Tattooed Serpent, uh, Natchez. Uh, and this took place in 1725. And they were still building platform mounds. And it was. LePage Dupraz, Dupraz, anyone here speak French? Yeah. Who lived with the Natchez for eight years. And Tattooed Serpent was the son of the leader or the king or the chief. Yeah. And uh, uh, he was, a, they, they made a good, strong friendship. They were friends, he wrote. And, uh, and then when, um, under British influence, when Native Americans attacked the Natchez in uh, 1720, nine or 30, I think it was, uh, the Natchez were routed and they scattered, went across the Mississippi. And the last person to speak the Natchez language died in Oklahoma in 1908. But uh, here's an artist's reconstruction of the, the death of, 
uh, tattooed serpent. So mounds existed. Indians were using them and so forth. And, was, and then uh, to resolve this issue, the federal government said to the Bureau of American Ethnology, uh, you have to use 20% of your budget to figure out what's going on here, which at that time was $5,000. <laughs> and I put just uh, today $5,000 would, that $5,000 would be $156,000. A little inflation over the time. But, uh, and the man who was put in charge of it was Cyrus Thomas, uh, who worked uh, at the Smithsonian. And he is skilled in many things, ethnologist, linguist, uh, entomologist, he was a climatologist, and as I put here, a reluctant archaeologist. He didn't want to do this, but he was told he had to. So it took about seven years. He sent people out to different parts of uh, the, the East. There was a crew that came uh, up the Mississippi as far as Prairie du Chien, and then uh, skipped up to Trempolo, and that was as far as north as they went. Uh, but uh, he gathered all this information, and um, he at first he was kind of leery. He, he had no idea of how this would turn out, but by the end of it, he it's a the book you can still buy it. The Smithsonian has reprinted it's about like this. But his summarizing chapter just nails it and says basically the mounds were built by the indigenous peoples who were living here. There's there's no argument otherwise, uh, etc. And so um, he began also trying to get the federal government to put more effort and money into making sure that Native American cultures uh, could survive. Because by the end of the, 20, of the 19th century, it's estimated that may, there may have been no more than 300,000 Native Americans left alive in the United States, although the census records are not accurate uh, for that. So, uh, and this is him right here, uh, the reluctant archaeologist. But, uh, he did the work, uh, or he had his crews do the work. He, had, he was the bureaucrat. There you go. So uh, I was going to say, what about Native Americans? You know, um, they don't constitute a large portion of our population, but uh, I, my feeling is that they've left a wonderful legacy, yeah? uh, and a legacy that uh, uh, has sometimes been, I think, sometimes wrongly stereotyped in some fashion. Um, and in other ways, celebrated as well, and for the right reasons. Uh, there are people who just happen to end up in North America and South America, uh, and uh, were very successful for thousands of years. And so uh, I think they, it's overdue what is people should do for them and doesn't necessarily mean giving them money and so forth, but just recognizing people for these kinds of accomplishments. Yeah. It's really quite amazing. So a, kind of a question, yeah. pre-European engagement in the Mississippi Valley, yeah. is there a sense of how large the population was and what the impact was of European diseases so that 200 no. years later, when they come out and start settling, um, is an excuse why the Indians weren't around and active on the mounds and all that, because they got uh, exterminated so much by disease. A better source to look at, if, you want, if you're interested in the impacts of disease, is uh, accounts from New England uh, in that area. <clears throat> when the French arrived uh, in the St. Lawrence, I'm simplifying this, uh, within about 30 years, the peoples that were living at the mouth of the St. Lawrence and I can't remember the name of the, the culture, but we're gone. I mean, disease just spread. Uh, and so um, that'd be a better, good place to start. Yeah. Have you heard of the book 1491? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's actually kind of a, if you want to kind of think more yeah. about that. I, I don't know what your opinion is on the scholarship yeah. there. But it's, it's a well, the person who wrote it was not an anthropologist, but it's a really well done book. And I like the uh, it's either article he wrote or the book itself. I've read both, but it's been a long time. But um, he interviewed all like five or six anthropologists, and he said, in 1491, where, there, where would you rather be living, in Europe or here? And to a person, they said, here. Because, <laughs> of course, 
the plague, etc., and everything else uh, in Europe uh, was devastating. But, uh, any other thoughts or questions? Uh, Thank you so Thank you much. Yeah. For Sorry, I went up. Thank you.